I'm going to, going to tell you about four delightful decades I've had examining the structure of the synapse. Actually, I'm standing in front of a giant picture of a synapse that I took about 40 years ago. Uh, the, uh, inside the synapse, you can see these little circles. Those are synaptic vesicles. And then you see those dense areas down at the bottom. Uh, that's a place where the one nerve cell, the presynaptic nerve cell, contacts the other nerve cell, the postsynaptic nerve cell. And it's right there that the presynaptic nerve cell releases transmitter to a, send a signal to the postsynaptic nerve cell. Now, once we had these pictures, uh, and uh, the, uh, the group at University College London had shown that this release of transmitter comes in little squirts. They called them quanta. It seemed obvious from the pictures that the vesicles might contain the quanta. Uh, so that was known as the vesicle hypothesis. And this is where I came into the picture. Uh, we had no idea how vesicles might release the transmitter or how new vesicles might be reformed uh, after they release their transmitter. At that, at that point, John Heuser joined my lab from University College London, where they were working on the, this beautiful preparation, the frog neuromuscular junction, which is a sausage-shaped structure. I've got my hand on it right here. And you can see it has synaptic vesicles, just like I said. It's a synapse between a nerve and a muscle rather than between a nerve and a nerve. And the structure is beautifully clear. And so we decided that we would stimulate it and see what happens to, to in, what changes in structure might occur upon simulation that would tell us something about what, how the quanta are released or, or at least remade. So when we stimulated, uh, we got an amazing result. The, many of the synaptic vesicles disappeared. And in their place, these big vacuole things appeared. And the vacuoles uh, 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 filled the inside of the synapse. And also, inside the synapse, there were little tiny vesicles with fuzzy stuff on them. These are called coated vesicles. And they were known to be the way that cells recover things from the outside. This made us think maybe the uh, vesicles are being released somehow, or used up somehow, and then they're being recovered by bringing in more surface membrane. And if that's the case, we should be able to test it by using a dense material that you can see in the electron microscope. Now, the synapse that's been stimulated here rec recovers it within minutes. And so if we put the dense material around the outside and let it recover, uh, if, if, it's, if the outside is the source of new synaptic vesicles, then the synaptic ves vesicles should have the dense material in it. And indeed, they did. Uh, so here are synaptic vesicles with dense material. This was a synapse that was stimulated. It's recovered. And it's taken up the dense material into synaptic vesicles. This led us to propose a theory of synaptic vesicle recycling. The idea is that the synaptic vesicles are released and become part of the surface. And we thought this might be the case because when you stimulate the synapse, it gets bigger. But after the vesicles on the surface, it's recovered by these little coated vesicles pinching off and also perhaps by large vesicles uh, pinching off directly when you have very high levels of release. And once inside, the membranes get sorted out back and made back into synaptic vesicles. So that's the theory of synaptic vesicle recycling. The paper was very well received. Uh, John went back to London. And um, we were left scratching our heads because this theory was very unsatisfying and incomplete from both our points of view. The problem being that we could see vesicles lined up on the surface, but we couldn't see how they released. Uh, the reason we couldn't see is because we're using chemical fixatives. They're very, very slow. And so by the time the fixative got there, everything was over. And uh, we, we couldn't really catch that fleeting event that would involve the release of a squirt of a transmitter. We thought that maybe we could do this with freezing. And there was an old freezing machine in my lab that never worked. And so I, while John was in London, I got it down and started working with it. And I introduced a new technique I'll come back to in a minute later. I'm not going to say a lot about it. It's called freeze fracture. And it allows you to see the surface of a synapse rather than looking inside the synapse. And looking at the surfaces of the synapse, I could see this freezing machine was sort of working. We could occasionally see what looked like vesicles coming out. So I call up John in London. I say, John, get over here, and let's get to work on this. And he came over for about two months, and we worked with this machine with very, very spotty results. And we were scratching our heads. We didn't know what was wrong. But John gets a call from 
University College uh, from uh, U, uh, uh, University of California, San Francisco. Would you like to have a position out here? So John goes out to San Francisco, and that begins five years of he and I going back and forth across the country to try to work out this problem. Now, um, this is John, and uh, uh, who came back from London, and we spent a lot of time together, very intense time at University College San Francisco. Uh, the time was so intense that people, uh, it sort of cleared the oxygen out of his lab. A lot of people left. Uh, we argued like old married couples every day, and people said it was just terrible. And in fact, some people thought we might be an old married couple, but we weren't, but we were just intensely linked in this, in this quest to try to figure this thing out. And we kept doing freezing runs and freezing runs and getting, every once in a while we get a little result. And it suddenly occurred to, uh, to us, and when you are in this close relationship, you never know whose idea it is. The ideas just come together. And uh, uh, that if you drop something on something, uh, that it's going to bounce. And so these machines that were trying to drop things on the cold metal plates were gonna bounce. And so um, uh, we built a machine that was designed not to bounce using a, a, a made by a remarkable uh, machinist at uh, University of California called Jim Wall, who made the electrode pulling machines. And so this is an ad adaptation of electrode puller. And it's essentially an arm that holds the tissue and drops it down onto a block cooled with liquid helium. Now the key here was that we used a big heavy metal ring and a big strong magnet and uh, we also used uh, spring loading and by adjusting the springs and the magnets and we used electrical contactor to, to see what was actually happening when it hit, we figured out that, uh, we, that certain combinations of forces we could get rid of the bounce. It was very hard. But once we got rid of the bounce, we started getting beautiful freezing every time. And we could then go and look at the, at the uh, neuromuscular junctions. Now this machine that Jim built us had a, uh, the, the, the frog neuromuscular junction was mounted on that little, little uh, plunger thing on the end. And on that plunger was a little wire hook, two little wire hooks, and we could hook the nerve to the muscle. So on the way down, there's a trigger, and we could trigger a stimulus and stimulate the nerve right before it, the muscle got frozen. And we could look at, explore different time periods. And we uh, did some electrical measurements of the freezing rate, and we found that we were freezing less than a tenth of a millisecond. So we were able to do structure for the first time in sub-millisecond resolution. Now, when we looked at the uh, uh, neuromuscular junction at rest with no stimulation, we saw what we expected, vesicles, full of vesicles, some lined up on the surface. But when we stimulated four milliseconds before it hit, at two milliseconds we saw nothing, four milliseconds, all of a sudden the whole surface of the nerve begins to bubble and you see little, you see things that look like vesicles opening over down there and over there. They're little flasks, and the, so the vesicle uh, is fused and opened. Now, uh, uh, I want to stress this happens within milliseconds, and if you wait a few more milliseconds, these vesicles proceed to flatten out and dissolve into the surface. Now, using the freeze fracture technique, which shows us the surface, we could actually see that. Uh, you remember now the vesicle is a little flask, and if you looked at it from the surface, it would look like a ring. And as, as it flattened out, the ring would expand. And so what you see here at different times, uh, are the, is, is it, from left to right, is the ring expanding. And finally, it flattens out, completely flattens out, and you just see a little indentation. So this is a sequence of, of events that shows that the vesicles are actually fusing and becoming part of the, of the surface. Now this is exactly what we wanted to see uh, to, to fill in the, the gap in our uh, recycling theory because the recycling theory said that the new vesicles were coming from the surface. So how did the vesicles get to the surface? Well, now we could actually see vesicles uh, joining the surface and uh, flattening out on the surface. Furthermore, we could count the number of these events and we could measure uh, physiologically how many squirts there were and we could re relate the number of squirts to the number of structural events and uh, at different levels of release and they match perfectly. So uh, it seemed that we had very direct evidence of the, uh, of the uh, uh, vesicle recycling uh, hypothesis. Now any, any theory you come up with is going to have its detractors 
and uh, people are going to start, 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 start in on you, which is good, because that's what science is supposed to be about. And so uh, people started to think, well, maybe some vesicles recycle. Maybe other vesicles just come up to the surface and make a little opening and release a little squirt of uh, uh, transmitter. And th that was called kiss and run theory. And John remarked, why would anybody kiss and run when you could stay? But uh, uh, there are more and more evidence coming about for kiss and run. And it seems to me that it has a small part in some synapses for some reasons. We don't really know why yet. And uh, investigating it structurally, such a small rapid event would be difficult even with these freezing techniques. Uh, so that was a delightful decade of, of examining synaptic structure. And one night, late one night, John and I were sitting there exhausted. And I turned to John and said, why the hell are we doing this? Our lives are falling apart outside the lab. Um, <laughs> our wives hate us. And why are we doing this? And John turned to me and he said, well, you know, Tom, the most important thing in science is to be together with a colleague at that moment when you discover something. When, a, when some little piece of nature unfolds and, and you see something new.